I'm Dr. Greg Spatz. I'm Dr. Trevor Rappa. Uh, we're here just to talk to you a little bit about some of the hip mechanics uh, that's related to the blog post or, or the, uh, the hip impingement hip pathology program that you'll see. Um, so some of the easy biomechanics that we'll cover first, uh, we're talking about the pelvic position, what that means for the front of the hip. So labral tears, hip impingements, usually things that are happening on the front of the hip joint. So we'll see that oftentimes people are biased towards this hip flexed position where the acetabulum is covering over the femoral head a little bit too much and then you'll see just bony impingement right away so i want trevor to just demonstrate this position for you with a squat so you'll see he has that nice deep lumbar lordosis um, that's just going to put him in this position where he'll feel some blockage in the front of his hip right away before he can get to a depth that we're looking for that's a trainable depth that we're, we're shooting for um, as opposed to if he can kind of orient his pelvis where it's more in a neutral position or a midline position, which is going to be different for everybody. Um, we'll activate some certain muscles to try and reorient the pelvis related to the femur. And then from there, have him squat in that position where there's a lot less spinal movement going on, which is what we want to be able to see when we're putting him under load, obviously. Um, but you can see he can get a little bit deeper before he feels that pinch. So that's something you could try right away for yourself. If you just arch your back and squat, you're gonna feel that a lot sooner. Same idea with if you arch your back and kind of lift your leg, it's a lot harder than if you're in a more neutral position. Um, so uh, one way we'll start people off with this potentially is doing a double kettlebell, or uh, we'll just do a single kettlebell goblet squat to box first, and that'll be the first type of squat on the program that you'll see in the PDF. So from here, he's got the kettlebell nice and close to his face. Elbows are a little bit for, uh, further away from his body. And he's just using that box as almost like a depth gauge. Um, for Depends on the person, obviously. If this is somebody that has been squatting for years or they're very competent with their movement patterns, maybe they don't need the box. But this is where we're just going to say, for a cookie cutter program, we don't know who you are. As a, as a client, as a patient, we're just going to give you this squat to box uh, movement pattern here. Excellent. So this weight is a little bit of a counterbalance for him. Again, re, uh, reinforcing that position that we're looking for with the pelvis so that when he's hip flexing, we're not getting that bony impingement in the front here as if we were in that more you know, arched back position, forward tilt in the pelvis position. So a progression from the squat to box. We can just take the box away, um, or we can just use the box with a double kettlebell. So obviously, if you want to load it a little bit more, if somebody's strong enough where one kettlebell is, is not enough for them, you could do two kettlebell, squat to box. You kind of missed it a little bit. Doesn't squat to the box. Yeah, squat to the box. So that's where maybe if the depth is something that definitely needs to be controlled for, but you want to load it a little bit more, go for this. Excellent. And then let me kick the box away. And from there, double kettlebell front squat. Good, so this, this load again in the front is giving him a little bit of a counterbalance. His center of mass is nice and over a, a, a flat foot, right through his ankle. His heels are staying down on the ground and he's driving through his entire foot. Excellent, we're seeing minimal spinal movement. Uh, great job. One of our favorite ways to do a front-loaded squat where we can start to add some, some significant loads to it as opposed to the double kettlebell front squat, which eventually you're arms will be a limiting factor uh, would be a zercher squat. So we're big fans of this. Um, sometimes earlier on when you first start doing it, you might need to use something like a thin pad or wrap a towel around the bar because it, it is a little bit uncomfortable in the pit of the elbows uh, if, if you haven't done it before. But it could take you know a week or two or three to kind of get used to that discomfort. So if you need to, um, you might want to use something like this. But uh, a drawback is that the more weight that you put on the bar, the harder it is to use something like this because you just sort of lose some of the stability uh, with your arms. So uh, we'll just do it without this for now. Um, so I'll just show you an example of a zercher squat and then talk a little bit more. Let me get nice and tight in here. Wrap my elbows around the bar. I like to grab my hands together, kind of make a clenched fist right from there. Stand straight up, step back, good. And then from here, you're just going to let the bar dictate where you go. Good. So the weight of the bar, I'm not fighting against it. I'm using it to guide me to the position I want to go. I'm using this as my center of mass to sit me down nice and deep. Um, only going as far as my elbows will let me eventually, right? They'll hit my thighs. 
So uh, that's not an issue, but this is one of our favorite ways to load things because you can start to add a little bit of load onto it um, and could be a different option as opposed to a traditional front squat or back squat where your center of mass is more under your foot, nice flat foot, and you can load it and actually be able to sit back and use both your hips and your knees without any sort of irritation or, or aggravation in the front of your hip.